Hello, um, I'm, I'm honored to be here, so thank you for that introduction. Um, so I have a confession to make. I have never read The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit. I do not consider myself a well-versed fan of Tolkien, let alone an expert. I have nothing against the titular author of this particular lecture series. Uh, in fact, when I was awarded the immense opportunity of coming here to deliver this talk, I considered dropping everything in my life to read those books. Not because I wanted to, but because how could I step up to this podium otherwise? Fluency, if not fandom, felt expected of me. Which is exactly why, in the end, I chose not to read them. I have a very strong belief that reading should be an act of love of joy, of willing discovery. That when we force someone across the wrong literary threshold, we risk turning them away instead of ushering them through. I was at a book conference earlier this year on a panel when this very idea came up, the concept of gateway books, the stories responsible for making us into readers. Ironically, it was the topic of Tolkien that set the debate off in the first place. A male author on the panel beside me said, and I'm paraphrasing because I wasn't taking notes at the time, um, but the words are more or less burned into my mind. He said that a person shouldn't be allowed to consider themselves a lover of science fiction or fantasy if they hadn't read Tolkien. That his work should be essentially required reading. Required reading, which I find to be a dangerous label. As the guest of honor at that particular conference, and someone who has already admitted to you that she hasn't achieved that particular designation, I challenged him. I asked him why. Why was Tolkien the threshold, the marker, the metric by which membership in this particular club should be determined? And the author said simply, because he made me a reader. Because without him, I wouldn't be here. Which is wonderful for that author and for anyone who found their way to reading via Tolkien's hallowed halls. But there isn't any one door through which we must find a love of reading. In fact, such a prescription is dangerous and limiting. What happens when a budding reader is handed a book and told, if you don't love this, you don't love fantasy? Setting aside the fact that it's unfair to put that much weight on one book, I believe it's equally unfair to put that much pressure on one reader. I told the man on the panel I had never read Tolkien, <laughs> and he looked at me, not with derision exactly, but with such open astonishment, as if wondering how I possibly found my way into that chair, onto that panel, into that building, or ever into the pages of books without Tolkien. And I simply said, I found another door. It didn't seem to occur to him that there could be more than one, but that is the beauty of readership. It does not matter how we find our ways in, whether it's Boxcar Children or The Born Identity and McCaffrey or Stephen King, what matters is that we find them. I was 11 when I first found my door. As an only child and an overachiever, I was a very capable reader, but never an enamored one. I'd yet to find a story that could make the pages of a book disappear, one that could make me forget I was looking at words on paper the way a good movie makes you forget the cinema seat or the edges of a screen. And then a family friend called my mom. She was at a bookstore in Southern California and there was an author there signing her debut novel. It was geared towards kids my age and the friend asked my mom if I might like a signed copy. My mother, knowing I wasn't a passionate reader but not wanting to be rude, said, yeah, sure, that would be nice. And a week later, the book arrived in the mail. It wasn't very thick, but it had an illustration on the front of a boy on a broomstick flying through an arch. If you haven't guessed, it was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Well, Sorcerer's Stone, because this was happening in the States. The author, the one my mother's friend just happened to stumble on in the bookshop, was, of course, J.K. Rowling. This sounds like the beginning of a familiar story, I know. So many of my generation owe a debt to Rowling for fostering a love of story. But the simple fact is that without her, without that series, I'm not sure when I would have developed a love of fiction. Certainly not until much later. Harry Potter was the first time I fell in love. It was the first time I forgot I was reading books because I felt like I was watching a film inside my head. It was the first time I forgot where I was or who I was. Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling provided me with my first taste of true narrative escape. And from that moment, I was hooked, mesmerized by the idea that someone could use words that way to transport 
The alchemy of translating letters into stories. It was pure and simple magic. And it made me a reader. It was my door. But I would never set those books before someone and say, if you do not love these, you are not a reader. If these do not speak to you, you are not one of us. Because it does not matter which door you take, as long as you find one. Nearly 20 years after I stepped through my first door, here I am. Some of us find the door young and some don't. My father, who is 69 years old this year, has found his love of reading in the last six months since he retired, proving that there is no expiration date on doors. Something else happened to me when I read Rowling's books. You might have caught it earlier. I loved the story, yes, but I was also struck by the magic of the craft. The idea that someone using only words could transport or transform. And so in stepping through that first door, I found not only a love of reading, but the beginnings of my second threshold, the door that would make me a writer. I think a lot about creative lineage, the people and works responsible for helping to shape and sculpt our sensibilities as writers, musicians, artists, creators. So often we talk about books as entities unto themselves. After all, books have a beginning, a middle, an end. They have a shape. Sometimes we talk about the greater context, a body of work, the author's own creative evolution. But too rarely do we talk about heritage. Writers owe a debt to every voice that came before them, to each hand and word that helped to shape the creators they become. Perhaps for some, the sources blend. But for me, the two doors of readership and of writership are clear, their edges crisp, bold. The first threshold I owe to J.K. Rowling. The second belongs to Neil Gaiman. I wasn't exposed to Neil's work until I was in high school. I wanted to be a storyteller, and I didn't know what shape that would take. I kept being told to find a lane, to stay in it, and I chafed at the idea that I had to choose a single form. It was like being told to pick a certain size box, not knowing if you'll always fit, suspecting you won't. I feel like I found Neil's work all at once, though I'm sure that's just a trick of time and memory. But when I was 16, I vividly recall a period filled with Gaiman's writing. First, Neverwhere and Stardust, then a collection of poems and stories called Smoke and Mirrors, and then Sandman. And every time I seemed to encounter his work, it was in a different form, a different format. And yet every piece felt so thoroughly him. His voice ran through the stories regardless of their shape. And that was what I wanted, what I had started dreaming of. And Neil, through his work, showed me it was possible that storytelling could be a blanket instead of a box, something on which we display our wares instead of containing them. There are so many other writers who've shaped me, T.H. White, Susanna Clark, Holly Black, more every year. But these two make the bedrock of my identity as an author. People ask me why I write fantasy. I used to only have one answer, because I grew up wanting the world to be stranger than it was. Now I think what I meant, what I mean, is that I also wanted the world to be more. I was the kind of child who scoured the piled stone hills behind my grandmother's house in Tahoe, looking for cracks shaped like doorways, grooves shaped like keyholes. I would run my hands over the rocky surface and try to remember a magic I'd never known a password I'd convinced myself I'd simply forgotten. I told myself that if I could just remember the right words, the door would open, and I would find, my, find that other world I was so convinced that was there. That was my youth, spent looking for doors. Not because I was unhappy. I had the kind of loving upbringing that registers in your memory as a painting instead of a film, a still life. My mother is a dreamer and my father is a diabetic, and aside from her occasional outbursts and his occasional episodes, it was a perfectly stable, if rather solitary, childhood. I searched for ways out, not because I was miserable or lost, but because I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more. That the world was bigger and stranger and more magical than the one I could see. I suppose, in some ways, it was my version of faith. A belief in something you cannot see, cannot prove, but you search for it all the same, convinced that it is there. I grew up wanting the world to be stranger than it was in large part because I hadn't found my place in the version that was, or rather I'd only found my place in the pages of books. I wanted to be Alana and Hermione Granger. I wanted to be Jason Bourne and Jonathan Strange and Katniss Everdeen and King Arthur and Sabriel. I wanted to be powerful and important and free. I wanted to find the keys to the world. I wanted to see myself and be someone else at the same time, wanted to be reinvented as someone stronger, 
I never went looking for happiness, never folded myself up in romance. What I wanted were the adventures. I wanted to wander the world of the dead, wanted to cast spells and wear battle armor, fight spies and topple empires and tap into the well of magic I knew was inside me waiting to be woken, the same way I knew the world was big and strange even if I couldn't see it yet. That is the power of fantasy, of fiction, of story, of words. We're taught in school to use words carefully, to use them kindly, to use them well, but we are never truly taught, at least not in a classroom, how much magic they truly have. I discovered that magic first as a reader, but it wouldn't take me long to realize that the power worlds held over me was a power I could wield too. And once I discovered that, I was unstoppable, insatiable. I still am. Creativity is not only a potent form of magic, it is an addictive one. Before I was born, my mother had a prophecy read over me. It was that kind of family. <laughs> it wasn't the most generous prophecy, but it was incredibly specific. Some pieces were a bit unsettling and some were startlingly accurate. I would be from the beginning an outsider, a keen observer, a social mimic, someone lost inside my own head. But the part I loved best was the part where the psychic said I would have a gift for words. A gift she wasn't entirely sure I would use for good. She predicted that I would either become a cult leader <laughs> or a novelist. <laughs> and whether or not you believe any of this, it never fails to delight me that the spinners of stories rank with swayers of minds and faiths. A cult leader or a novelist. <laughs> the power to move masses, to hypnotize, to indoctrinate, to enthrall. Words are very powerful things. I often joke that writers are the gods of their own worlds. We are certainly its most adept magicians. Many authors talk about finding their way through their stories, about the mystery and the surprise and the reveal. They speak of their works as things that already exist, entities waiting to be discovered, uncovered, explored, understood. They see themselves as mediums, conduits. But I have always seen myself as a conjurer putting piece after piece into the cauldron until the spell takes shape, the contents become more than the sum of their parts. That's what spirits are in bodies, that unquantifiable spark. That's what stories are, too. They are what happens when ideas and words thread together into something more. A sentence is letters plus space plus meaning. A story is simply a sentence on a larger scale. It is alchemy. The transmutation of one element into another through some variable combination of method and madness. Impossible to quantify the ratios because they are different for all of us every time. Believe it or not, and it's becoming harder to believe about 13 books in, I did not set out to write novels. I'm an intensely visual person. I see everything before I write it down. I block out every beat, roll through the seconds of mental film, cut to different cameras in my head, different angles. Every scene comes with its own color palette. Every moment comes with an underlying soundtrack. I was a decent artist, but I couldn't find a way to fully bring what I saw to life using pens and ink and paint. And so I wrote. When I was a kid, I would write screenplays and then force my friends and neighbors and family to act them out just so I could see the story played out before my eyes instead of behind them. As I grew up, I became more attached to the words themselves, as if each one were indeed part of a larger incantation. There was magic in order and cadence, syllable and flow. For years, everything I wrote came out in meter and verse. Poetry felt like the most distilled form of power. I was 15 when I won my first poetry contest, and I still remember the eight short lines woven into the fabric of my life. Perhaps the moon is in the sea, reflecting up against the sky, as night beams bathe in ocean waves and all the stars swim by. I loved poetry, I still do, but as the stories in my head grew more and more elaborate, I knew I hadn't found the right form for them yet. It wasn't until I got to college, it wasn't until I tried short fiction and nonfiction and microfiction and screenplays and journalism that I finally realized why I hadn't tried to write a book. I was afraid. 
I was afraid I didn't have the attention span. I was afraid I wasn't smart enough to build something that large, afraid it would collapse, afraid I would fail. And luckily for me, I have a rather adversarial nature when it comes to fear. I had a fear of heights, and so I went skydiving. I had a fear of change, and so I cut off all my hair. I had a fear of leaving home, and so I backpacked through Europe before I went to college. I had a fear of failing to write a book, so I sat down and started writing a book. I finished my first novel, and it was terrible, as all first novels should be, but it was a start. And the high of not only starting a story, but finishing it was the most addictive sensation I had ever felt, and I was hooked. Since that first foray, I have always written fantasy. Now and then I've tried to dig my toe into realistic fiction, but within a few chapters, I invariably find myself longing for a demon or a ghost, a way to work, make the world stranger. Fantasy, it must be said, is a very large umbrella. Some insist on breaking it down into further smaller shelters like speculative, high fantasy, second world, urban, supernatural, thriller, fairy tale, magical realism, and so on. And yet, for such a broad concept, we too often seem to have a very narrow vision of it. It need not always have wizards or dragons, necromancy or magic, or chosen ones or worlds we cannot touch. I have written about witches on the English moors, libraries where the dead are shelved like books, superpowers born of near-death experiences, elemental magic in alternate Londons, and cities where violence breeds actual monsters. When I say fantasy, I simply mean a story in which one foot or heel or toe is not planted on firm, familiar ground. But my favorite fantasies are the ones where the other foot is where the line between the known and the new, the observable reality, and the strange fantastic is dotted, if not blurred. It goes back to my childhood, searching those Lake Tahoe hills for cracks in the stone that might be doors. Because a fantasy set entirely in another world is an escapism with limits. You can read about it, sure, but you can never really get there. Fantasy with a door, a portal, a way in, that breeds a different kind of belief. It is the difference between Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Middle Earth is accessible only on the page, but Narnia had a door at the back of a wardrobe. That wardrobe is not simply a piece of furniture. It is an object that instills doubt. Doubt that the world is as simple or mundane as it seems. The kind of doubt that makes a child climb into every cupboard and armor they can find, looking for doorways. When we make readers doubt their own reality even a little, we grant them hope for a different one. Writers of fantasy possess a very special kind of magic. We have the ability to change the world. Writers of the speculative have the incredible opportunity to speculate, to reinvent and reimagine. We have the power to create spaces where diverse readers can see themselves not only as tangential, but as essential. Fantasy authors have the opportunity to tell stories about characters whose real life analogs are often cast to the outside edges of the narrative and to center those too often relegated to its fringes. Which is why it's disheartening if I'm being generous and maddening if I'm being honest to see so many new stories conforming to such old conceits. To see so many contemporary fantasy authors subscribing to antiquated models either because of nostalgia or the ease of well-worn roads, or more likely because they still feel adequately represented by them. It is a waste. The most beautiful part of writing fantasy is the freedom, not from rules, because we all know that good stories need good worlds, and good worlds, whether they're rooted in fantasy, sci-fi, or realism, require solid scaffolding. No, not from rules, but from the exact details of the present we inhabit. We have the opportunity to subvert the established tropes, to redefine power, to conceive of social landscapes and climates perpendicular to the ones in which we currently live. Fantasy allows us to explore the strengths and weaknesses of our own world through the lens of another, to draw a concept out of its natural framework, its classic well-worn context, and examine the underbelly of the idea, to restructure and recenter. Fantasy affords the luxury of close examination of the self and of society laid within a framework of escapism.
It can be a commentary, a conversation, and it can also be a refuge. Good fantasy operates within this seeming paradox. It allows the writer and by extension the reader to use fictional and fantastical analogs to examine the dilemmas of the real world. And it also allows the reader to escape from it, to discover a space where things are different, stranger, more. In my opinion, there is no such thing as pure fantasy. Fantasy, like all stories, has its roots in reality. It grows from that soil. Stories are born from what if, and that question will always be rooted in the known. What if is by its nature a distillation of what if things were different? And that question depends on a foundation of what we want them to be different from. In that sense, all fantasy is in conversation with a reality we recognize. It is a contrast, a counterpoint, and in my, in my opinion, the best fantasies are those which acknowledge and engage with that reality in some way. Perhaps that means we see the world we are leaving. We board the train to Hogwarts. We step through the wardrobe. Or perhaps we must simply acknowledge the foundations on which our story is born and from which we are departing. I'm not necessarily advocating for fantasy as an overt metaphor. The questions and counterpoints need not be the driving force of the narrative as with Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. But that question, what if, is strongest when it challenges the world we already know and finds a way to pivot from it to ask more interesting questions, to tell newer stories. Because I am, must confess, I am tired of one true kings. I am tired of stories centered around a young white man learning how to wield power as if the real world doesn't already do enough to prepare them for that. I am tired of stories where women are either princesses or whores or manic pixie dream girls who have no story of their own, but exist only as plot devices and obstacles and pit stops on the quest of the male lead. I am tired of stories that look and feel, act and behave like the world in which we already live because they subscribe to the same conceptions of hierarchy, the same delineations of power, the same accepted norms. And as tired as I am, I cannot fathom how tired some of my colleagues are. What seem like hills to me must be mountains to authors of color. I know that. I can only hope that in helping to create commercial fantasy that breaks these old molds, I can also make space for others to do the same. I love this space. I love fantasy and I love what it has the potential to become. There is this fear I sense from authors, most of them straight and white and male, as if moving forward means leaving the past, their particular past, behind. And perhaps in reality that is true, but in fiction those rules do not apply. The old is not erased by the new. It is not replaced by the new. It is only made better, stranger, more. That is why I write fantasy. <laughs> Why I've always written fantasy, to make the world stranger than it is, more than it is, better than it is. I write fantasy because I want to feel the way I felt when I stood on my grandmother's stone hill searching for those doors. The way I feel when the air suddenly shifts and I can smell the energy in our world like the beginnings of a brewing storm. I don't write to create a magic that isn't already there. I write to access a magic that is, to amplify it so that others feel it too. I write fantasy to make cracks in the foundation of a reader's expectations, to challenge the solidity of their assumptions and beliefs. I write fantasy because I want to bolster the believers and make the skeptics wonder, to instill doubt and hope in equal measure, to help readers envision a time, a place, a world where fantastical concepts like magic or immortality or equality seem within reach. <laughs> My favorite stories are the ones laid like gossamer over our own world, the ones that make magic feel close at hand, that promise us there is a door even if we haven't found it yet, the ones that make us doubt our senses, the way a paranormal experience or a near-death experience or a spiritual experience makes a cynic doubt their own established and accepted truths. One of the most satisfying experiences I've ever had revolves around my novel, Vicious. It is a book about two pre-med students who discover the key to superpowers are near-death experiences. That the proximity of fatality can trigger a permanent adrenal shift. I threaded my magic through with science, took what is, and nudged it just a measure into what it could be. And about three months after that book came out, I got an email from a man who couldn't sleep until I told him the truth. Was any of it real? <laughs> 
a full-grown adult <laughs> sent me an email in the middle of the night because the question, the idea, the what if was keeping him awake. He was sure, he was almost sure, but the doubt had crept in like kudzu in the south, peeling up the clean foundation of his mind as it made room to grow. I wish believing in things were always that easy. I wish I could write a reality that was kinder to so many of those reading my work. Wish that like in a darker shade of magic, the strengths of one's power was more important than who they fell in love with. I wish that I could center women and LGBTQ and people of color in the real world as easily as in my books. But until that day, I am committed to doing it in fiction. I will write powerful women and princes in love with princes and worlds where the monsters that plague our own have shapes that can actually be fought and bested. I will write flawed people because people are flawed and I will write books where those who are often relegated to sidekick or token or object are centered in the narrative where they have their own agency and their own power and their own story. I will write what I love and what I long for in the hopes that for someone, it might not only be a way out, but a way in. In short, I will write in the hopes of writing someone else a door. That's all. <laughs> So I think um, if you have any questions, that is a thing that we are doing now. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions about anything, uh, raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. Don't be shy. What? Yes, don't be shy though. <laughs> this isn't a scary room. It's far scarier for me. This is, there are many more of you than there are of me. You can do it. Someone has to be first. Yeah, up there. Now they're going to make you use a microphone. Yeah. Um, thank you. I enjoyed the, your talk very much. And I'm interested by the, the reference you made near the beginning about maybe the connection between fantasy and religion, and maybe it's a substitute. And I'd like to talk to the, the story of how you could have been a cult leader. <laughs> I guess, again, it's, it's the same parallel between uh, fantasy and religion. And obviously, you could write fantasy from all kinds of religious standpoints and, and none. But, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on what exactly you see as the relationship there and maybe what, you know, uh, yeah, is yeah. there a kind of substitution there or can we work as well? For me, there certainly is a substitution aspect between um, power structures. So for instance, in my fantasy novels, I love, and in really in most books you're going to read, there is some examination of power structure. There must always be um, social and power hierarchies. For me, I like to juxtapose the two. I like to challenge religion in my works as its own form of power structure, as its own form of worship. And so I have a series in which magic is a substitute for it, in which magic undergoes the exact same procedure almost and is worshipped in very similar ways to a Judeo-Christian philosophy. I don't think they're necessarily at odds. I would say that um, I'm not a particularly religious person and I think that there's a, a slight hypocrisy sometimes to the way that we elevate religion over other things, the way that we are willing to look askance, um, to not look for logic, to, to suspend the need of logic in favor of belief in this one narrow band of life. So I think I'm fascinated by the specificity of blind spots that come in when religion is at play and the ways that we're swept away by concepts of power and also by sacrifice of agency. I think it's a very alluring thing to believe that there is a higher power in charge because it allows you to sacrifice a measure of your own agency in anything that happens. But I also really like creating analogs to religions in my books. I just like to have a little bit more freedom and perhaps not make as many people angry <laughs> as I might if I, if I vilified an actual religion. And so I like to create myself a fantastical analog. But I think most well-written fantasy books need to address the power of, the idea of power balance in some way. It's hard to generate a society that doesn't worship something, whether it's a god or money or, um, a stability. There always is a driving force between the socio and political uh, aspects of a society that usually has a, a, a vacuum if you don't have some form of power in there. Yeah. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much. It was You're a welcome. wonderful talk, and I actually was part of this talk a couple of years ago, so I know what it's like to be up there. It's terrifying. <laughs> and I've got, well, I've got two things to say. First of all, when Gabriel told me about this talk and told me you were speaking, I thought, oh, God, I have to go out and read everything you've written. <laughs> See? Uh, I haven't. I haven't read anything you've That's written, great. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I also envy you that you haven't read Tolkien, because when you get around to reading Tolkien, it will be amazing. Um, I look forward to it. I look forward to reading it of my own volition instead of the expectations that are put on. I think that's one of the dangers of required reading that we impose is the books I've come back to of my own volition after education have been the most enjoyable rediscoveries. I totally agree with you. And, and the other thing that I found really refreshing is when you were talking about how you think about fantasy, some of the things you were echoing are actually things that, as when you read on fairy stories by J.R.R. Tolkien, yeah. <laughs> he was talking about in terms of recovery and looking at things of our world through a lens of fantasy to appreciate them better. So I thought that was that you're you're taking that and putting your own take on it, which I think is amazing. And I'm looking forward to reading your books. Thank you. And I just want to say, I think we we see these repetitions. It's purposeful. I think it's a thing that every generation of writers re-experiences. And I think the most powerful things can happen when we're given the space to have those discoveries and those conversations on their own. And I, I am in no way attempting to slander or, dis, or dismiss classics. I think, though, that we have to also make space for the contemporary to become the new classic. When we constantly only look backwards, we don't do as much moving forward. And so I, I, am, I am a huge fan of classics. I just always find it a bit baffling when um, you find the generational lines come out um, and what one person or what one generation holds up as the end all be all or as the, the, the Bible of fantasy or of science fiction or something, it has to be allowed to shift as well. We have to make, or at least we have to make room in the canon. I think there's a reluctance to make room in the canon sometimes. And I think that it is only an additive process. That's all right. That is something that always clicks with me. Is I'm not ready. I can feel in the future for when I am ready. And I'm just wondering, is there anything, any movie, music, book, you know is coming, but you just don't know when you're ready for it? Uh, to be honest, I was just very recently ready for Philip Pullman. I read Fulman, Philip Pullman in this last year. And I think it's that thing where there's also these ebbs and flows of the tide of when things are best. So I think you'll notice that there are these things you love in childhood, and then if you don't discover them until you're 20, then you don't like them. And then if you discover them when you're 30, then you do. So there's times that we need the parallels in our, in our life and different stories. I knew when I missed Philip Pullman, when I missed his dark materials at that age, I wanted to wait a bit until I could read them as a writer now instead of having tried to pick them up or ha kind of having them encouraged to me over and over again in my late teens. I knew that wasn't the right time for it. But now I'm also, I write children's books. I write for that 11 to 12 year old audience as well. And it's very, very powerful to get to experience something. But I held off on his dark materials for years until I, because I often, a lot of times I'll get readers, this happens where you pick up a book and you put it back down because it's the wrong time. And, and I think you have to have that freedom as well to acknowledge that just as like, books are static, books exist in a single form for the most part, unless you're Stephen King or Neil and you go back and you edit them a bit. Um, they, they're a static thing. Readers are not static. Readers are constantly changing. And so I think we have to make room for that with fiction. I always say that as an author, I'm, we are having a conversation, the author and the reader, and I'm only providing half. I can control what I put down on the page, but I can never control what the reader brings to it. And the readers are an amorphous, shifting, uh, I mean, everyone is unique. A book is one thing, but every reader that comes to the other 50% of that conversation is different. And so often I'll encourage readers, because I have the same experience with me, sometimes you're just not in the mood for it. Sometimes you're not in the right headspace. But it's it's important to realize that at another point, it might be exactly the thing you need. And so I'm a very, what I said at the very beginning about, I believe that reading is, a, is an act of love and of willful discovery, like willing discovery. I really truly believe that there's a right time to read books. And so often it's not, it's that it's not you, it's me game. But like sometimes we as the reader are not in the right place for a very specific book.
yeah. you could use it. And it, it, it immediately leapt out to me that the first Neil Gaiman book he read was Neverwhere. Yeah. Which is a character called Door. I know. <laughs> Door, doors are, are often a common feature. I'm just thinking about where we are. Mm -hmm. There's a door in the back of the wardrobe. Yeah. It's Narnia. But that door closed on Susan. Mm -hmm. And that led me to thinking about Sean Maguire's Every Heart of Dawn, yes. a wonderful novella, where it, 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 it's a refuge home for young girls who've fallen into fantasy worlds and get spat back out again. And it, it got me thinking that maybe as teenagers that finding doors is really quite easy for us, and that the hard thing is not finding the door, but keeping it open. I think that's a brilliant concept. I mean, it's the, it's the constant idea of, of, they say that young children can see auras or can see ghosts or can see more of the world. If you think about it more as like the visual spectrum and we can only see a limited amount of color and light, um, I think that when we're younger, we have the widest. And then I think often readers get in their own way, especially when it comes to the fantastical, because they think, oh, that's not appropriate or I shouldn't like it. It's it gets relegated to being a subgenre. It's, oh, I should be reading literary fiction. I should be reading realism because I'm an adult now and that's what adults do. When the truth of the matter is, one, some of the most uh, complex conversations, um, sociopolitical conversations are happening in fantasy because they can happen through a very specific lens. Um, but also, I think I really wish adults gave ourselves more space for that kind of discovery and for imagination. I think one of the one of the most the largest disservices we do to ourselves as adults is try to take ourselves too seriously, you know, and to think if we won't we won't be taken seriously if we love if we love fantasy. But I think honestly that escapism in whatever form it takes is one of the healthiest forms of self-care we can do as readers to give ourselves space to both get away from that world and to find our place within it. So I don't know, I, I've seen fantasy novels, been taught at a very advanced level courses. I've been seen them shunned in advanced level courses. I also think it's important to remember something like Tolkien was commercial fiction. You know, that we, we can re relegate things to the lines of like the, 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 the pedestal we put something on when it's been out for a very long time. But it's very easy to do that with long, long ago things. We have a very hard time allowing ourselves to enjoy things, both either in an academic way or simply in an in for fun. I don't know. I think there's one of, so one of the best things I ever saw. It's a very tiny anecdote, but it goes back to J.K. Rowling, is that um, I must have been 14, and I was walking through a park in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I live part of the year, and I saw, this was, so the books weren't all out yet, this was about halfway through the series, and I saw, sitting on a bench, this was across from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, I saw two professors in one of the most intense conversations I had ever seen about Harry Potter. And they were just like, they were digging into it. They were, they were not tearing apart, they were arguing about one of the small rules of the world. And I remember having this incredible moment as I walked past and I thought, oh my God, like I want to write something that, that can be enjoyed and taken seriously. You know, and I think that's the thing is we're all reading on different frequencies and on different bandwidths as well. There are people who pick up my books and are like, that was pure escapism. I loved that because it just got me out of my own head. And there are people who pick up my books and was like, that made me think so hard about the place that my country is in politically, you know? And I like that books can be both because books are going to be a different thing to every single person that picks them up. I also use a lot of doors in my books. Often they're metaphorical. I, I love the, the liminal spaces and the lines between things. But I, I, and I went back and forth on like three different metaphors I could have used for this talk and ended up settling on doors because I do think it's very important to acknowledge that they do close. That if we're not careful with them, a door leads out as well as in. And that we have to do what we can to prop those doors open. Um, I really sympathize on the talking. <laughs> moment was admitting to Brian Aldous no less at a conference on the time machine that I'd read it that morning and didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I do you have a question? Yeah. Though? You threw out something quite casually just then about reading like a writer. Yes. Francine Prose uses the phrase for her book. Please talk about reading like a writer. Oh, honestly, I think it's one of the best and worst things that happens to you. I have a very hard time um, taking off my writer hat when I read. And in some ways it's great because when I do love a thing these days, I love it 
to an evangelical degree. If something can make me forget I'm a writer while I'm reading it, the hardest thing is that you start picking apart the nuts and bolts of it. So I do this thing, I'll either read a book twice, or I use a film as a better metaphor because a film is usually two hours long and it's easier to do this. And I encourage writers to do this all the time when I do workshop. I say, take a film you love and watch it twice. And the first time you watch it, you're just watching it as a person watching a film. And the second time you watch it, watch it as a writer and start breaking down the pieces of dialogue that work, how many beats are in a scene, what feels off. Like you can tell, you start looking at things through a very different structural lens. And I find myself putting down a lot of books because I think I can see the author's hand. I can see what they're trying to do. And the trick in writing a book is you should never see the author's hand unless you're writing a kind of work that's, that's uh, satirical or that's playing a very overt hand. Um, but for the most part, I get frustrated when I can tell that a writer is trying too hard on a sentence. I can tell with a lot of new writers when they're trying to make every sentence a work of art, when the truth is you can't do that in fiction. You have to find the rise and flow in the tides of prose. Not every single sentence can be poetry. That was the thing I learned the very hard way coming from poetry. But the beauty of that is when I do find a book that makes me forget. I think uh, it can be incredible. I read about 100 books a year, 100 to 125 books a year, about a third nonfiction and two thirds fiction. I read, I can't take off my writer hat. It is sewn into my skin. Um, but reading is still to me one of the most important ways to fill the creative well. It's one of the most important ways to get outside of myself. I would be devastated if I ever lost a love of it. There have been times when I've entered reading slumps and that is the most depressed I have ever been because when you can't find solace in the things that normally speak to you, um, and I'm not a huge rereader, so I don't just go back and live again in the places that I lived before, the well-trod paths. But no, I think it's an, both an important skill to have and a bit of a burden. And that I, there are times I truly do wish I could take off my writer hat. But for the, for the most part, I think it really assists me in being able to see. I love when I find something that's truly working and I think, God, oh, that was brilliant. Or like, I see what you did there. Because I think there's a level of appreciation also that comes with it. I just finished reading uh, Circe, which is Madeline Miller's new book. And um, I was lucky enough to interview her recently. And, and that's one of those works where I think I appreciate it even more because I'm a writer, because I can see how perfect the stitching is in a lot of it. I think there's a level of, of focus that you get to have as a writer where you can truly tell when something has gone into a work from a different angle. But yeah, I, I, I know that's a very muddled answer to give. I can't really, these days I can't separate myself from it. I do wish I could sometimes just be a reader, uh, but it's difficult. Have you ever experienced that as a writer? You've got to bench an idea. Yeah. I have an idea that's been benched for six years now. So I first got the idea in 2011, 2012. And I waited at first, the first two years I waited because I didn't have the full story in my head. And I'm someone who needs to know my story. I know the, all of the endings before I start. So I know exactly who my characters are on the last page of a book so that I can rewind them and figure out who they should be when we first meet them. I need to know. And so I don't start writing a book, first of all, if I don't have a good sense of how it ends. So first two years is because I didn't know how it ended. And then the next four years is because I did not feel I was a good enough writer. I had a very, very ambitious task ahead of me. And I, I it was only in the last year that I've started working on it. Um, it's called The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. And it was a book that has been just the longest germination. Usually I'm about one to two years. I keep a back burner in my mind. I liken it to a kitchen stove in which you have three or four pots on very low heat at any one time, just kind of their flavors getting richer. And so I usually have a one to two year um, stove time before I pull it forward and start actively making my soup or whatever it is. But yeah, um, that's the only one so far that I have been, I mean, it's, go, it's going to approach a decade before it's done. And that's daunting, but also one of the best things, one of the best decisions I ever made was not to write it quickly or not to rush it because you, for the most part, only get one crack at a story. You can get many, many cracks at a theme, you know, or a motif. But with this specific story, I just want to do it once and I want to do it right. Yeah. Victoria, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um
you spoke about minorities, LGBTQ, and so on. Um, I think maybe we have this often this kind of conversation in Oxford. Um, many mainstream writers, because they wish for commercial success, will often default back to writing for the masses. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in your case, this wasn't the case. Yeah. And for that, I admire you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could give some advice yeah. how it is possible for others as well, whether they are writers or not, to, to not sort of to, to have commercial success or whatever yeah. you define it as acceptability and and reach the masses yeah. while at the same time doing what you're doing and advocating? Huh. <laughs> um, so it's a very, very difficult question. For me personally, um, often it comes down to the difference between presence and perspective. There are perspectives I don't feel entitled to write. There are perspectives which are not my own and the stories that go with it. But what I can do when I don't feel comfortable writing the perspective is to have presence on the page. I want as many readers as possible to be able to see themselves in central roles. That does not necessarily mean that I am writing a story about a young African-American growing up in Atlanta. That is not a story I feel entitled to tell. What I can do is make sure that the vast majority of characters in an entire one of my Londons, especially the royals, are people of color. You know, I can make sure that my readers see themselves on page even if I can't tell a specific narrative because I don't feel like that's my own to tell. Um, I'm queer and so I, that is something I do feel very comfortable telling that narrative. But even still, as with anything, there are no monoliths here. And so whatever you do, you're going to be telling one specific story. You are not going to be speaking on behalf. You cannot speak on behalf of an entire group of people. So I think part of it is like acknowledging that you are going to be telling a specific narrative. Honestly, I did not know that these books were going to get commercial success. Uh, Darker Shade of Magic, which was really my first book to break out, was my eighth novel to hit shelves. Uh, I had a revelation around my third book when my career was not going well at all, that if I was going to keep telling stories, I was going to write what I wanted to read. And that was what I was gonna focus on. I was going to write whatever story it was I wanted to read and not care about the marketing. Because the thing is, you can do everything right in publishing and it will still go wrong. You can do everything right and your book won't be commercially successful. The only way to guarantee that you are not disappointed by writing and by publishing and by commercialism or whatever it is, is to make sure you love what you write. And the best way to love what you write is to write for yourself. So I just continued asking myself, what do I want to read? I wanted to read about female pirates. I wanted to read, you know, a queer prince romance. I wanted to read strange Londons and libraries of the dead. I had to pick that for myself because I got to a point when I realized I can't control any of it. And yes, the, the concept of the mainstream, which is very centered on like the straight white male hero, is still has legs much to my chagrin they come out a dozen like by the dozens every year a whole new chosen one young white man for women the women are not named you know like the women just orbit um and there is a huge amount of tokenism these things still happen but i do believe that progress is being made it's being very hard one it is definitely one grueling step forward at a time to one every easy stride by the mainstream, but I just think that the best thing you can do is tell the story that you can tell and the story that you want to read. I honestly, I wish that there was, I, I don't know how to do any more than that. It's all that I know how to do at this point is to write stories I want to read. So I write for myself. And what I thought would happen is that it would narrow my audience. I thought, okay, if I only write for myself, who else is going to read it? And what I found instead is the more aggressively I wrote for myself, the more my enjoyment and passion of what I was writing came through, the more people wanted to read it. So it's paradoxical, it's a little counterintuitive, but I have found the more one writes for themselves, the less they pay attention to what sells, to commercialism, the better grasp they get on the commercial market. Because I think the biggest disservice that gets done is people rushing stories for the sake of, the, of having something out there. People rushing stories because they think, oh, this is hot, or this is on trend, or this is going to pass me by, or I better catch that train. But I, I don't believe in that at all. I think what happens when you do that, like I was saying with Addie LaRue, you get one crack at the story it is that you're trying to tell. Do it right, 
Do it to the best of your ability. Put everything you have into it. And I think, I'm not saying that equals success. There is no formula here. But what it does guarantee is that you will have done everything you can. And I think that that passion and that specificity of your lens, of your story, of your idea will come through. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a little more on that protagonist breaking the mold. Yeah. Because reading a lot of fantasy, one area that really seems to be making progress with that is young adult fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had any ideas of whether that is the case and also if there's something about young adult fantasy that means it's a place that is more friendly towards that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So I write in both young adult and adult uh, and middle grade. I think part of it is that the delineations of subgenre are not there so much in YA. YA really encourages a cross-pollination of subgenre. So you'll find romances in space, and you'll find um, historical thrillers that also have dragons. Or you'll find they, like, they, they have a cross-pollination that really allows for a lot of very innovative story models uh, that break a lot of those classic forms, a lot of those classic tropes. They're allowed to subvert those tropes, I think, quite not more easily, but there's a bit more freedom. Whereas in adult genre, you're often challenged a bit to think, how does this fit? Where does this fit? Where is the audience for this? The other aspect of it is that young adult is such a voracious community. The downside of to that is that young adult is a very short minded community. Like everything is one step ahead. Everything's very flash and pan because there's this concept that if you're talking about actual teen readers, of which young adult as a readership is much, much broader than just teens, but actual teen readers, they're teens for only a few years. So there's this sense of urgency. Everything needs to play out right now very quickly. Things that are popular today are gone tomorrow. There's a sense of a little bit of fickleness in that industry that counterbalances the, the freedom of plot. But yeah, I do find that there's freedom of plot, but honestly, I've encountered um, between K. R. Sonat Rivera and N. K. Jemison, there's a huge wave um, happening. They're the two leaders in my mind. They're two of my favorite authors right now um, of really excellent, diverse fantasy that is mainstream, that is still challenging and subverting those tropes. I honestly think we just need more. There's a challenge because with the publishers, they look at what sells, they look at what has sold, and it's hard because they're then basing their present and their future models based on what has sold in the past. And so each, they're running a business, and it's very difficult for them to break their mental molds because they know what sells. And so it's about challenging that. It's about showing them a series like A Darker Shade of Magic can be successful. And suddenly, oh, you don't need to just have a, you know, a young, straight white male protagonist alone moving through the world. There can be other characters. There can be other strengths. So I do think that there, I don't want to write off adult genre in terms of the progress that it's making. I do think that there's an incredible freedom to YA in terms of simply um, how much story leeway is given for an invention and exploration. It doesn't have to fit any expected mold. Hi. Um, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about with the, the story about Aguilaru, how you had to wait two years to come up with the ending because you like having the ending first. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of writers talk a lot about different ways to approach a book, whether you, you do have an outline or you do kind of just go into it free-minded. And I definitely relate a lot more to what you were saying, yeah. needing to know where a story is going. So I was wondering if you could speak to sort of the difference between not how not coming up with ideas, but when, when you have that idea and you know what it is that you want to write about, but the sort of percolation period of waiting for that that ending to come to shape in your mind and how that's different from just having an idea but knowing where you want to go with it. So to use probably like my 50th me like metaphor of the night, um, I picture Oh no, I can go back to the cooking metaphor. Hold on. <laughs> I'm just gonna go down a squirrel metaphor route. I realize coming back to the cooking metaphor is better. Um, I have to collect ingredients. For me, stories don't come all at once. I'm very envious of authors who can dream whole plots. I think that's wonderful. I've only ever done it once and I forgot it upon waking, so it hasn't served me very well. But I collect pieces. For me, one of the largest things is the world. So uh, I primarily center outsiders in my world. That takes many different forms, obviously, metaphorical and physical outsiders, those who actually come outside of a world and those who are born inside of a world but feel outside of it. But in order to 
write stories where outsiders are the protagonists, you really have to understand what they're outside of. So you have to understand the insiders of a society. In order to understand the insiders of a society, you have to understand the society that they fit so cleanly into. And so all roads tend to lead me back to world building first. So I look at that as like the board on which everything happens. That's, a, that's the first thing that happens. And then in terms of the story and the characters and the themes and all of that, they're all ingredients in the soup. And sometimes I find the smallest one first and I set it aside. I find a bigger one and I set it aside. I can't tell you, I'm, I'm not a very metaphysical author when it comes to my work. I like controlling things, but the moment where it becomes a meal is still a moment I'm never really prepared for. I don't know what it is. Usually it's a question that turns in my head. Usually it's something that inverts what I thought the story was going to be. Or I don't come up with a story and think, oh, how can I make it new? It's usually just that I don't have all the pieces yet. I'll sometimes get a visual image. In A Darker Shade of Magic, there's a, there's a scene in which the two main characters collide. One walks through the wall in the world and collides with the other one. I had that visual of this young man bleeding heavily, walking through a wall, colliding with a girl dressed as a boy. I had that visual a year and a half before I had the plot for the book. I just had this image and so it was an ingredient and I set it off to the side and then I was talking with a friend about how I wanted to write a love letter to Harry Potter. I wanted to write a, a book that made me, not, not story-wise, not plot-wise, but a book that made me feel the way I felt when I was in love with the Harry Potter books in terms of having a location in fantasy that I actually wanted to spend time in. Fantasy is wonderful, but there are very few places you actually want to spend time. <laughs> Nobody here wants to play in the Hunger Games. Nobody here, you know, wants to get trapped. Narnia is, Narnia is a place you might want to go, but there's a lot going on there too. And so I wanted to write a world, like I grew up dreaming of Hogwarts. I grew up knowing I wasn't going to get my letter in the mail and still thinking about what house I would be in and what, how it would happen and how I really just think I wish I had like gotten to go to Hogwarts a good seven years before everything else went down so I could just enjoy my academics. <laughs> just have a good life there and get out before Harry arrived and everything went awful. But the point is like, I, so that was a thing. I knew I wanted to write a love letter to Harry Potter and, and I knew I wanted to use magic. I was a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender and I thought I love how they handle elemental magic in that show. And then it was what really sold it for me is talking about doors. I was talking with a, a beta reader, a critique partner of mine, and she mentioned that I had done all of these stories about doors, but most of them had been metaphorical. I had yet to do a portal fantasy. And the moment she said portal fantasy, I thought back to the visual I had in my head of the young man walking through the wall. And I thought, what if he wasn't just walking through a wall or a hidden door? What if he was walking between two worlds? And it was like all of the ingredients got dumped into the soup simultaneously, you know? But I never know what it's going to be. And for some things, it's a much longer steeping. And for some things, it's three to six months. But it's never faster than that because I don't want to rush in. I have zero trunked novels, so zero novels that I've started and have not finished. The reason being I do not start until I know that I have something that could be a novel. Yeah, are we? Are we? I think we've got one, one more. Question. Okay, yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for an amazing talk. Um, I think like, a couple of other people have mentioned, um, I really respect that you, you know, choose such a like, diverse cast of characters. I was just wondering, do you get a backlash from both within the writing community and also, you know, yeah. not necessarily the kind of internet trolls, but like, <laughs> genuine people you respect, but yeah. also how you deal with that? I think the largest backlash that has happened so far is that my books got censored without my permission in Russia. Um, I did not find out. They had qu cut the entire queer storyline. Uh, they had cut the, the, the OTP of the series, the proper romance of the series is between two princes. And, um, and they had cut it without my knowledge, without my consent. Uh, they, the publisher simply did it. And I did not find out until one of my readers who happened to read in both English and Russian sent me a side by side. And uh, it was horrifying because I got a lot of backlash from Russian re we pulled the We pulled the contract. Basically, they were in breach of contract. We terminated the contract with that publisher. We were able to find another publisher. Which, so it's now coming out again unedited, um, uncensored, if you will. But I got an immense amount of backlash from Russian readers who said, oh, God, I can't believe you're getting so worked up about this. It's like three pages. And the fact is, I would have rather cut a massive part of the plot than three pages of character. That three pages were so important to me, and the erasure of them was so horrifying. And so I think, yeah, I was very surprised by the backlash to that, um, that people told me I was being precious about something that meant so very much to me. And as a, as a queer woman, the idea that, that these two characters' 
personhood was not as valuable as the plot. Uh, was uh, very, very upsetting. So um, yeah, that's honestly the most overtly horrifying thing that has happened so far. I do a pretty good job of not reading basic reviews because reviews, in, unless they're coming from critical, like critically esteemed sources, reviews are for readers. They're not for the authors. They are for the conversation that happens on the other side of the page. And I can't control any more than what's already on the page. That is my contribution to the conversation, you know? You, I think it's so important to remember that no matter what you do, because the people you're writing about are not a monolith, they cannot represent an entire thing. One of the biggest problems with queer representation in fiction is because there are so few in mainstream fiction, the queer characters are being asked to do too much work. So they get put on a pedestal because there is a Darth of them. So if we had more, then maybe every queer character didn't have to be a hero if we had, without it being immediately synonymous with villainy. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do just in terms of, across all diverse fronts, having enough representation that it's not tokenizing, that you can actually treat those characters as three-dimensionally. I always say we never reduce straight characters to their sexuality, but we are very good as readers at, at reducing queer characters to their sexuality. And so, yeah, but that, the Russia thing was, was, the, was really awful. <laughs> Um, but I'm very, very fortunate that uh, one of my other Russian publishers has picked up the works and, and they're being released now in their proper form. Yeah. Thank of course. Um, Hold on. Aww. <laughs> um, as a of our Thank you. Speak, um, we'll yeah. Time. We know how much you love <laughs> I have a collection of mugs from around the world. Oh my God, thank you so much. There's no such thing as, t what is it? Well, I mean, that's a C.S. Lewis quote, which I'm going to butcher now if I try to say it, paraphrasing. But what is it? There's no such thing as a cup of tea large enough to, or a book long enough. Thank you. I can't believe I just butchered that quote. <laughs> right, everything else is oh, perfect. perfect. So, thank you so You're much. Um, before we do the applause and everything, which we definitely need to do, I just want to have a couple of notes. Um, we're going to head out to a drinks reception after this. Um, and there's a book vendor outside, which you probably all noticed. Um, if you are inspired to pick up a copy of the book, please do. Um, Victoria will be doing some signing throughout the reception. It's only going to be a little less than 30 minutes now, um, but we'll try to get through as many people as possible. Um, and then afterwards, those who are attending the dinner, we're going to start moving to the Forte room at about 7.45. Um, other than that, if you have any other questions, see one of us. And thank you all for coming. And please let us give a huge thanks to Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. I love my mug. <laughs> it's perfect. Thank you guys so much.